Hi, my name is Ken. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Ken. I don't want to say you guys put much pressure on me, but you want me to tell my whole life story in 11 minutes? And, uh, <laughs> and you don't want me to skip anything? And uh, I had a sister at hot dog story. Uh, <laughs> But I'm real glad to be here, glad to be sober. And I was real thank to you, all the people involved with bringing me here and getting me around while I was here and had a chance to meet a lot of new people and that's always fun and interesting. And I had a chance to see Goldine and Bob again who I just met within the last year and that was real rewarding. And also Gene and Jill and Jerry, people I had met back in Omaha. So I'm, what I'm trying to say is I'm real happy to be here. It's always nice to stand in front of one of these things and not have to enter a plea. I, uh... <laughs> Ooh, <mate. laughs> but if you uh, if you tend to be very intellectual, you can go to sleep right now because I got through school totally unscarred by education. You know, I grew up with and got sober with guys. If you said there's a dead bird, we all looked up. You know. Most, most of the guys in my neighborhood think that Moby Dick is a venereal disease. So it's, uh... <laughs> a buddy of mine was asked one time, how do you spell Mississippi? He said, you mean the river of the state. You know, uh, 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 we, were, we were all totally unscarred by education. And I come to these meetings and I, uh, you get a chance to share and it's very interesting what takes place but because people hear stuff and when the meeting is over they come up and they credit you with saying something you never said but it's going to change their life so you don't mind you know that's an alcoholic's dream you get credit for something that you never did so that's not too bad but the flip side of that coin is every now and again, and I hope you're not here today, somebody will come up and credit you with something you never said, and on top of that, they disagree with it. <laughs> so you have to all listen from where you're at, and if I say anything that sounds out of context with what your sponsor said, or you read in a book, or whatever, I'm obviously wrong, okay? So don't try to get me after the meeting because we have a plane to catch. <laughs> it's like we hear all these words and we think we understand them. It's like a little kid who was in Bible school. He had just studied a big lesson. And the teacher said to him, trying to impress the minister, Bob is gone, but trying to impress the minister, she called on this youngster and she said, John, what do they call it in the Christian world when a man can only have one wife? John stood up, looked at her, and said, Monotony. You know? So we all hear differently. Now, I don't know about the hereditary part of this disease, and I don't have to know. I just know that I'm the youngest in a family of seven kids, and we're divided into two groups. Either you're in AA or you need it. You know? My mom said when she was alive, the only time I ever heard one of you kids say no to a drink is if you misunderstood the question. You know? <laughs> I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, it was one of those neighborhoods where people would say, how far is it to the subway? And we'd shrug our shoulders and say, we don't know, no one's ever made it, you know? <laughs> And there was no such thing as private property. If it was small, we took it. If it was too big to take, we lay down next to it and try to claim it, you know? And this is basically my background. And then I got to AA. See how quickly I got there. Time will do that. But when I arrived in Alcoholics Anonymous, I went to my first meeting on April 5th, 1970, 
And through the grace of God and the fellowship of this program, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink since that time. Yeah. Now, when I arrived in uh, Alcoholics and my mom thought it was very, uh, she said, you know, that's great that your sobriety date is July 5th because you get everything on a 5th. But when I, uh, when I arrived in Alcoholics Anonymous, just to give you a thumbnail sketch of where I was at, my wife and children very wisely had moved out of state. I was in the process of going to jail again. I had a habit of finding things before people officially lost them. I looked like I was in a gang war and my gang didn't show up. You know? <laughs> I had all the poise of a dog on the freeway. <laughs> and my health was shot. And I went into that meeting and I met a guy who was to be my sponsor. See, it was July, it was New York, it was hot, and I was the only guy there in a suit and vest. And somehow they intuitively knew I was a newcomer. <laughs> and he walked over and said, first meeting? And I said, boy, I tell you, these guys must know something. And at that meeting, he made me feel welcome. And they knew real well in New York, as they know in most alcoholics meetings, that the newcomer, you have to have rabbit stew before you have a rabbit, I mean, you have to have a rabbit before you have rabbit stew. So you got to keep that newcomer coming back. And one of the early things they did with me is they gave me an owner's manual. Looked just like this. <laughs> See? And I never had an owner's manual. And every time something came up, they'd say, check your owner's manual. <laughs> and I started reading that owner's manual. And I read the first story in there about, about Bill and how he tried to do everything to stop drinking. And nothing worked. And finally, one time he was put into a hospital, and the day he came out of the hospital, he said to himself, surely this must be the answer, self-knowledge. In the book, there's a period, and then the next sentence starts, but it was not. And if you read this book, the thing that will become hopefully painfully clear to you is the fact that you are not going to get well through your mind here with this disease. And then I jump quickly into chapter 2. In chapter 2, they introduce a description of a real alcoholic so that we would know when we meet one, you know, <laughs> as if the world needed a description. Now, I don't know about how it works out here in Nebraska. I'm sure it's the same way, but back where I come from, both in New York and California, it comes down to, if you don't know what an alcoholic looks like, all you have to do is listen. Because they only have four basic responses to any question that you ask. When talking with an alcoholic, you'll hear four things, no matter how clever they are. They may not all be used at once, but they'll be used. The first one is, yes, but, you know. And the second one is, you don't understand. And the third one is, I'm different. Now, if they're real sick, they use a lot of that together. You don't understand. I'm different. And then the last one you'll always hear is, I know that. <laughs> and you know they don't, because if they did, they wouldn't do it. And then in chapter 3, it, it talks about more about alcoholism. And they put that chapter in there because it's the main chapter between 2 and 4. That's why they call it 3. <laughs> My parochial school general equivalency certificates begin to pay off. <laughs> but in that chapter, it's just a whole series of people thinking, thinking their way out of alcoholism. And it's one failure after another. And through every form of experimentation and self-deception, people try to think their way through the disease. And then what happens is, as a result of that, 
they, they come to the realization that they're always being led back to incomprehensible demoralization over and over and over and over again. And in, in chapter 2, I, I should mention that in that chapter, it also points out, and there's a solution, it says there's a riddle here, and we don't know the answer to the riddle. Can you imagine AA admitting to not knowing something? But it says, why the alcoholic reacts differently from other people, we don't know. We don't know why. But what we do know is that if the alcoholic does not take alcohol, he tends to act much like other men. Therefore, big sentence, should be all capitals. The main problem of the alcoholic rests in his mind rather than in his body. The three words you never want to hear an alcoholic say is, I've been thinking. <laughs> you know? You can just bet the word more is in there several times. More of this, more of that. An alcoholic can take any solution and turn it into a problem. You know? We go to a, we go to a wedding and we want to be the bride. We go to the funeral we want to be the corpse. You know? Just always want to be at the center. You know, that's just our makeup. And when people come into Alcoholics Anonymous and observe the meeting, they sometimes get the misconception that when people are sharing and we're laughing, we're laughing at their problems. Nothing could be further from the truth. We never laugh at people's problems. We laugh at their solutions. You know? <laughs> I always like it as Goldine shared when somebody's been married seven times and it's a, they're all ecstatic, they just got engaged. <laughs> and it's like somehow it's going to be different, you know. This time it's going to be different. And so the deal is here as we get into then chapter four. And in chapter four, it talks about the great reality. And it gives me the biggest promise that I'm given in Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't realize it at first. People always talked about the promises and had me reading on other pages. But there's a big promise there. And it talks about the spirituality of this program. And it says if you can wash away all the prejudice that you have about God, two things will happen. Number one is you cannot fail in Alcoholics Anonymous. Not that you may not fail, perhaps may, to guarantee you can not fail. And the next sentence says, the God of your consciousness will come to you. Not that it may come to you, it will come to you. And so that's a guarantee. And what you'll find out is that the people who stay here any amount of time will pick up on that guarantee. We have to have a spiritual program. The words in the book all lead up to it. If you look, it says things like, we will be rocketed into the fourth dimension. We have to go there. If you've missed the trip, make reservations. You know? Because the mind we have can only think in three-dimensional things. We have to get out there in the fourth dimension. We'll intuitively know. Being unscarred by education, I looked up that word intuitively. It means to bypass the thought process. When Bambi's in the woods and he sees a man with a gun, he doesn't go through some big process like, I wonder if it's hunting season. You know? I wonder if that bozo can shoot. You know? Bambi boogie. You know? That's intuitive thinking. And it also says we will suddenly realize, just like that. You know, if you stay around here any amount of time, a lot of things will become painfully apparent to you that you'll wonder how you missed them when you first got here. But truth comes all at once. It doesn't come on the installment plan. One minute you're in darkness, and the next minute you're in light. That's the way truth comes, all at once. And I can't give you truth, and you can't give me truth. We can share our experience, strength, and hope, but truth has to be experienced. See, it's not your truth until you experience it. Then you know it. And it doesn't seem to be absolute. It's absolute at the time, but it changes. Not that truth changes, but what we know about it changes. 
And as we grow and become more spiritual, things begin to happen. And as Goldine put me on the spot last night, she mentioned the fact that when somebody gets here, I always say, if you go to meetings and hear people share, you'll hear them share this horrendous prologue of all the things that went wrong in their life. And then they'll say, something happened. And I went to an AA meeting. Something happened. I was forced to an AA meeting. Something happened. I was sentenced to an AA meeting. You know? Something happened. I was brought to an AA meeting. You know, whatever way it comes out, something happened. And that something happening is a spiritual experience. It's God intervening and saying, I'm giving you a shot. And you don't have to believe that. I mean, I know you're dealing with a mind that couldn't accept that you're an alcoholic. Now to tell you that God intervened and sent you to AA would completely blow you out of your seat. You know? I love it when people say, I don't think so. You know? Please, please. You know, I hung out with guys where we raped and pillaged Brooklyn. And we didn't suddenly say, hey, this is getting out of hand. We better go to AA. Someone get a meeting list. You know? Let's go. You know, this is, uh, put that down. It's not ours. You know? That's not what we did. You know? We could move stuff in 15 minutes that would take the Santini brothers a week. You know? Because we didn't have damage insurance. You know? <laughs> and then finally I arrived in chapter 5. How it works. You have because it works. We read how it works. Just take it out of it and put God there. Because God works how God works. This is a God deal. And so I arrived there and the thing that became painfully apparent to me and it didn't become painfully apparent in the first year was the fact that I had grown up and I had lost track somewhere along the line of who I really was. And not wanting to be totally detached and being totally afraid all the time that I would have no identity, I made up an identity. I developed an ego. And that ego was not real. Its effects were real, but it was not real. And so you guys told me, if you take these steps, what will happen is your ego will dissipate. Won't go away. Got too much. Joe. Uh, but it will dissipate because the thing that you'll find out is if you have an ego, it's fictional. And the one thing it cannot stand up to is fact. And as you take these steps, you get an, app, an opportunity to introduce more and more fact into your life. And as you introduce more and more fact into your life, that ego tends to go away. That's just the way it is. It's like fear. It's not real, but its effects are real. And that's why alcoholics sometimes go through, not sometimes, almost all the ones I know, go through a life experience ten times before they get to it. You know? My divorce is final in six months. What am I going to do for a, for a new house? Don't worry about it the day before you divorce. You know, why go through all these worst case scenarios? What happens in 92 if we get the wrong president? We've done so far so good. You know? <laughs> I'm always amazed when people are afraid of screwing up. My new philosophy in life is be a verb. Don't be a noun. You know? We got too many nouns in AA. Be a verb, you know? Leap before you look. You know? <laughs> Don't talk it over with anyone. All you're going to get is their opinion. Go and do it. By the time you get done vacillating and examining it, you could have tried it. I know people that say, in three years, I'm, I'm going to have to make a decision about this. Do you ever have somebody in your group who was trying to make a decision? And they say to you things like, well, I, I know I should change. I've been praying about change, you know. Talked to my sponsor about change. Went over his house. Inventory changed. When the hell are you going to change, you know? I mean, why don't you just do it and then it will be done? And vacillation 
and thinking is what we do when we don't want to take action. I'm not opposed to people knowing math so they can figure out change in the store. I'm real opposed, though, when alcoholics say to me, I have to think about this, please. That's like watching someone change deck chairs on the Titanic, you know? Like they're over here, and then they go over there, you know? Like, oh my God, they're still thinking. When someone starts with, I've been thinking, just, you say to yourself, that's what they're doing now because they can't make a decision. That's why we let everyone share in Alcoholics Anonymous from the newcomer on, because we know people have to verbalize things so that they can understand the problem. They have to get it out. That's why we let them talk, because we know sooner or later they're going to forget themselves and tell the truth. <laughs> and when it happens, you'll see it. The fear comes in their eyes. Help us shelter, help us shelter, you know. Now they know, now they know, you know. As though we didn't know in the first place. So if you're going to be a sponsor, do what good sponsors do. Learn to listen. And listen all the way to the end. Don't interject your advice. You may be giving them a solution to a problem they don't have. That's, a, that's another three years of thinking. You know? It's like the guy who showed up at the sperm bank and he was 87. And the nurse said, what are you doing here? He said, I want to make a deposit. She said, sir, you're 87. He said, I want to make a deposit. So she gave him a jar. She said, go down the end of the hall and fill it up and bring it back. So he took it, went down the end of the hall, and a half hour went by. She got scared, went down to see what was happening. She knocked at the door and she heard this voice say, come in. And as she walked in, she seen this man all ruffled up in the corner. It looked like he was wrestling with a gorilla. And he said, miss, he said, I've used my right hand. He said, I've used my left hand. He said, I even banged it off the wall. He said, I can't get the lid off this jar. You know? You know? And I know sponsors who would jump right in there. Yeah. yeah. Problem false, you know. <laughs> so if you're going to be a good sponsor, have the courtesy to listen to the end, even if they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> because they have to hear that, you know, they have to go through that process. And the longer you're here, you'll hear people say, I'm having trouble finding God. I don't know where God lives. And we have a step that says we seek God through prayer and meditation. Really throws you off the track. And so people say, well, how do you meditate? And I don't know about you guys, but meditation for me is that time of the day when I get perfectly still and I go from mind to no mind, from ego to egolessness. And it's that time of the day when I meditate, I don't solve a problem, I solve all the problems. Because what happens is, when I come back from my meditation, I feel as though everything is okay. I don't have to know how it's going to work out. That's why we have a spiritual program. We are no longer bound by logic. You know? When people say, well, how can you be sure it's going to work out? I say, it always has. Now, you guys don't know this, but when we came here, talk faster, Ken. Uh, when we came here, Bob and Goldine and myself, we had a flight that was going to leave at 10 after 1. And you guys had me set up to speak last, and it's a, it's a rush now, but it was going to be impossible then. And it's a lot, the only plane out of Scotts Bluff today to Denver. And so I, I didn't know how it was going to work out, so I just let it go. And a couple of days before I was to come here, I got called on Tuesday. Bob and Goldine didn't even know. But the flight, for some reason, was changed to 135. Now, you guys may say, hey, is he saying he expects miracles? No. I rely on him. <laughs> no. And one of the things that you'll find out here about the spiritual part of the program is the fact that there's two laws of compensation. One of them is the materials world. 
It's a law of economics that we all understand. If you have a hundred dollars and you spend it, you no longer have a hundred dollars. But there's a much bigger law than the material law of economics. There's a spiritual law of economics. The more you give away, the more God gives you to give away. You cannot tap out. If you hoard it, you'll, you'll soon find it gone. But if you keep going and giving it away, you never run out. You wonder sometimes where it comes from. Thinking. See, you don't ask those kinds of questions when you are really in tune to the spiritual part of this program. And it's, people say, you say spiritual part. I know the whole program is spiritual, but there may be some newcomers. We don't want to scare them off yet. You know? Remember, you have to have a rabbit before you have rabbit stew. And alcoholics that I observe, not only in myself, but in others, we go through life scratching shit that just don't itch. You know? <laughs> Which is about as useless as hubcaps on a tractor. You know, we just do it, we go along, and we, and we, we diggle, 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 you know? And we, we know, because the book is very emphatic, that you're going to have to get well from the inside out. But most people get well from the outside in. In California, when they come in, the first thing they do is make a big decision on whether they're going to join family fitness or not join family fitness. Smoke or don't smoke. Look for Miss Wright or Miss Wright now. You know? Because they know that's what God wants. Yeah. I pray about it. And she appeared. Yeah, because you sat on her lap at every meeting. And we start to get well that way. And so you go through all those things. You, you know, you dress up the outside the way you think you have to dress it up. And then you'll reach a point in life where there'll be some speed bumps. And you'll notice it's not how well you look that counts, but how well you feel. And then the real growth begins to take place because there's no more questions to be asked. See, if you're constantly approaching life like it's a problem, then you have to get an answer. You begin to understand it's a mystery, and you don't have to know any answer. And it gets real, real simple. I read in another big book, which is not approved literature in AA, I'm sure, of the Bible, and there's a sentence in there, and it says, Be still, and know that I am God. And how very unstill I was when I first got here. I didn't know how to be still. I think being still for an alcoholic is a death-defying act, you know? We don't know how to do that. We don't know how to just stand and understand that it's not going to be all right, but it is all right. No matter what's going on around us, it's okay. And I'm always impressed with the fact that people think there are normal people out there, the normal people. There are no normal people. There are just people you haven't talked to, you know. <laughs> we all swim in the same water, and that's one of the big things where you come to realize here. And we all have the same things that we're trying to work out. And it gets real, real peaceful if you allow it to be real, real peaceful. And you learn to live totally in the now. We have trouble, it seems, living in the now. It's like the guy who met a gal in Vegas, and he said, I'd like to spend the night with you. And she said, no way. He said, I'll give you $10,000. Within moments, they were upstairs in a room nude in a, on a bed. And she said, kiss me on the lips. And he did. And he said, I don't know. She said, well, then kiss me on the neck. And he did. And he said, I don't know. And finally, she said, then kiss me on the breast. And he did. And he said, I don't know. She said, what don't you know? He said, I don't know where I'm going to get the 10 grand. See? <laughs> See, that's alcoholic thinking. You're right in the middle of a good thing and you're projecting a problem, you know? Learn to live in the now. After you're here a while, you'll find out there is no there and then. People talk about there and then. There is no there and then. There's only here and now. 
And when you're in the present, God is right there with you. There is no problem. There's nothing to figure out. There's nothing to become. We already are. From the day we were delivered into this world, we were God's kids and it's okay. And we don't have to figure out anything. I'm always impressed with the fact that people say, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. Hey, go back and take that third step. If you take that third step, it's not your life. You've given it up. It's his life. Let him worry about it. You know? Don't worry about, well, am I going to have money? Am I going to have this? Am I going to have that? Don't worry about that. That stuff all gets worked out. If you're sober and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, we're, we're free from the logic. We don't have to figure it out. That's the nice part about it. You don't have to spend all your time going back trying to figure out, what am I to become? You already are. You know, it's, when a rhinoceros comes into the world, he's already reached the quintessence of rhinocerosity. <laughs> but as Barbara mentioned, when a, when a human being comes into the world, we're into the process. And we're into the process of becoming. And we're always becoming. And God knows exactly what we're going to end up if we just let him at the control. But somehow we don't want to do that. I had an opportunity not too long ago to be in a little plane. And in that little plane, you maneuvered it on the ground by the pedals. You know, that's, you made your left turn, your right turn, based on how you maneuvered the pedals. And there was a little kid with his dad in that plane, and his dad was letting him sit in the jump seat next to the pilot. And there was a wheel there. And he, the kid said, can I turn the wheel? And the father said, sure. So the kid was, had the wheel. It was going left. It was going right. It was going all over. But the pedals were working the plane. And I often felt after that is, that must be the way God looks at me. You know? <laughs> I'm down here on the, on the wheel and I'm... <laughs> and he's softly going... And once you come to the realization that all good comes from God, it's one source, then it can come by any channel. You're not limited. It can come anywhere. Sometimes God, to show off, makes bank shots, you know? <laughs> That's just to let you know he's doing it. And you wonder, how did that happen? And then, whoops, sorry, I didn't mean to ask that. And don't lay around in bed and contemplate problems. I hear alcoholics in California share, when I get up in the morning, somebody introduced the word committee. I don't know where it came from. But people get up in the morning and they say, I don't get out of bed. I listen to this committee and they're arguing and they're going, hey, I may be unscarred by education, but I read. At one time in my life, I had a chance to read for four years. <laughs> I was in a state institution of higher learning. And so I read good shit, you know. <laughs> became an avid reader. And the thing that became apparent to me is that although I was unscarred by education and learning to read is the fact that 97% of the people who died in this country last year died laying down, in bed. If you have any fears, it should be bed. <laughs> when my alarm goes off in the morning, I get up, you know. I say, hey, that's where they die, laying down. If he made a mistake, let him live with it. You know, I'm off. And now that you're up, go do something, you know. Be a verb. Don't be a noun. Get out there. Leap before you look. Make life worthwhile. Don't live in fear. There's absolutely nothing to fear. The effects may appear real and you have that impact, but there's absolutely nothing to fear. And the most powerful force in the world is found in this room, and it's love. There is no force more powerful than love. And the thing that happened here is that when you come in, you get the right kind of love, because people give it to you unconditionally. And as was mentioned by Barbara, I believe, about attachment. Love has absolutely nothing to do with attachment. Love doesn't have anything to do with the other person. Love is a state of being. Either you are love or you aren't love. A rose is love. It gives off its fragrance because it has no choice but to give off its fragrance. It doesn't say, here comes Kenneth, shut down, you know? <laughs> That's not the way it works. And you give love because you have to give it. You have so much of it. 
And it's unconditional. It's not like, well, I give you this if you give me that, you know. And it's not attachment. It's detachment. And I didn't understand that either. And I used to think it's totally insensitive to be married to someone and say you're detached from them at the same time. And then I understand, or I came to understand that sensitivity had to do with awareness. It had absolutely nothing to do with attachment. It had to do that I was aware this person was there, they had a right to be there, and they had a right to do anything they damn well pleased. And my job got real easy. I just got up in the morning and went and screwed something up. <laughs> Go do it early. Get it over with. You know, don't... <laughs> I mean, we're living in a world where the water's polluted, the air's contaminated, at least out where we are. The food has carcinogens in it. Every day I read, I can't eat something. doesn't stop me, but I, I can't eat it officially. <laughs> and I hear people say, well, I'm afraid of making a mistake. We got a president who, who imagines the past and remembers the future. You know? <laughs> we, <laughs> we have an attorney general who's a defendant in more cases than he's a prosecutor. <laughs> We had a chance to hear those Iran-Contra hearings. Those were an alcoholic's delight. I stayed home and watched those. <laughs> we had this military guy up there, and he had all this regalia, and he was a nice guy, clean-cut looking guy. And they said, Sir, did you lie to this committee a year ago? And he said, Yes, I lied to you. <laughs> Sir, did you lie to this committee six months ago? He said, Yes, I lied to you. Sir... Are you ashamed that you lied to us? No, I'm not ashamed. <laughs> Sir, are you telling the truth now? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and things change, you know, they're changing all the time. Be part of the change. I remember about a guy who was in Paris and he got, got he's never been to Paris. And he got in the cab and he said to the guy, take me to the best bordello in town. So he went and he met a gal and he went upstairs and he did everything he ever fantasized about doing. And he came down and he said, how much do I owe? And the guy said, it's free. He said, it's free? He said, yes, it's free. So he left, went home, came back the next night, said to the guy, I want to do the same thing all over again. They said, fine. Did the same thing all over again, came down. He said, how much do I owe? And the guy said, 10,000 francs. He said, but it was free last night. He said, yeah, but you were on television last night. You know? <laughs> so things change. You never know when you're going to be on TV, you know. <laughs> Live your life like today was the last day and then nobody owes you anything. Get it all in. Don't put anything off. Don't postpone anything. If your job gets in the way, quit, you know. <laughs> People... <laughs> She's saying, not you, Charlie. <laughs> you get your ass up and go. <laughs> but we don't know how much time we have. We're all on loan to one another. And it's very, very fragile. Life is very, very fragile. I kid about the fact that nobody in my family made it into Alcoholics Anonymous. The end result of that was when my dad was 50, he died in my arms behind this disease. He walked from one room to another and went into an alcoholic convulsion and choked to death. And at age 50, he was out of the game. And I had a brother who two years ago, and I had a sister also, who two years ago, my sister went into the hospital in October of 86, and Christmas Day, she hemorrhaged for that period of time to Christmas Day, and she weighed about 65 pounds. She had cirrhosis. They couldn't stop the hemorrhaging and the bleeding. And she died Christmas Day behind this disease. And Christmas was a Wednesday that year. So I went from San Diego to New York and we buried her. We had the wake on her. She was waked from Wednesday to Saturday and we buried her on Saturday. And I went back to San Diego and I went to a big New Year's hoot nanny that they had every, every year. And when I got home there was a phone message. My brother had died in alcoholic convulsion. New Year's Day. So we buried my sister on Christmas Day, and we buried, or rather, she died Christmas, my brother died New Year's. We buried them each on a Saturday, and my nephew got picked up that afternoon for drunk driving. And he had watched his mom die behind this disease, and his uncle died behind this disease, and it had no impact. So I understand the serious part of the disease. 
But the deal is, is there is an answer, and that answer is Alcoholics Anonymous. And there is one who has all power, that one is God, may you find him now. And what you'll come to realize, hopefully, the longer you're here, as I said before, is that there's nothing to be worked out. It's already worked out. And you have to pass it on. You have to be active in the program. You notice that in this book, there's no chapter that says, into thinking. You know, into analyzing, into evaluating, into equating. It's into action. It's real simple. Bill and those guys, through some divine intervention, I'm sure, knew that the one thing you didn't want to have two alcoholics doing was sitting around discussing the world situation. It's much better if they go get somebody. I used to call my sponsor, and he was a very wise man, very wise man. He taught me how to be a good father. He taught me how to be a good husband. He taught me how to do things that I just didn't know how to do. He taught me how to be honest. He taught me how to get a job. I used to think all the traditions came down to we're self-supporting for our own contributions. It's real tough when you have to make a career change later in life, particularly when you were used to finding things before people lost them. <laughs> and you had to go fill out a job application. <laughs> What's your experience? Come on. <laughs> But he allowed me very gently to do those things, and he kept me attached to his family. He used to have me over his house. And, and involved with his family because I didn't have one of my own at the time. And back in the East Coast at that time, we didn't say sponsorship. It wasn't even a word. I'm sure it's in the book here. I've read it several times. I think it's in the chapter to the know-it-all. <laughs> But we used to put the hit on people. And I'd call him and say, you know, I'm alone. I don't have a job. I don't run, run. He'd say, good, I'm glad you called. There's a guy in the Bronx. Go get him. I said, what's that got to do with me? He said, go get him. So I'd pick some poor slob up in the Bronx and take him to a meeting. And I'd listen to his troubles. And I'd go home feeling real good. <laughs> and then I'd call my sponsor the next night. And we went through this over and over again. And if he didn't send me, if he had no one for me to go get, he used to say, hey, look at it this way. You might hit the jackpot and die tonight. And he'd hang up. <laughs> Very sensitive human being. <laughs> And there was a time in 1983, to show you how God works, at least in my life, is the fact that I didn't know I was going to go through a period of burying 11 in my family in an 18-month period. And I had no idea that was coming. And so what I did was in 83, I decided that I wanted to do something different. And so I signed up in the hospice program in San Diego. And part of that deal is you work with, well, all of that deal is you work with people who are terminally ill. And before they take them into hospice, their diagnosis or prognosis has to be a year or less. They don't take people who are expected to live four and five years. They just don't have the, the people to work with them. So they take people who only have a year or less. So I was assigned to a guy, the first guy I ever went to see. And had, at that time, about six months left in his life. And I went to see him, and he was real angry, 72 years old, dying of lung cancer. And it was a painful death. And he said, I'm real angry. And I said, what are you angry about? And he said, I don't want to tell you because you wouldn't understand. And I said, why don't you give me a chance? He said, no, I don't want to tell you. You wouldn't understand. And I said, look, I'm here to help you, so tell me. And whatever it is, we'll try to do it. He says, okay. He said, but the most important thing in my life, you won't understand. And I said, what is it? He said, I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and he said, I have 39 years sober, and I should have gotten a cake two months ago, and I'm too weak to go at night because the cancer just knocks me out with the medication during the day, and I'm pissed. And I said, what do they have you on? He said, liquid morphine. I said, you load up on that shit. I'm going to take you to a noontime meeting and give you a cake. <laughs> so he loaded up and we went. And he got up at that meeting and he shared for about three minutes or four minutes because that's all he could stand up. And he never talked about what was going on with him. All he talked about was how happy he was, he was to be alive and to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so he went back into a convalescent unit and went back on all kinds of tubes and needles and everything else. 
And as it worked out, God had a plan for him. He lived another whole year. And I got to give him another cake, his 40th. And during that year, I have a lot of guys who call me up. Wimps. And they say things like, Ken, she's leaving. Ken, I lost my job. You know, Ken this, Ken that. So I'd say, look, I can spend some time with you, but I got a commitment to see this guy every day for an hour. So if you want to go with me, you come with me, and then I'll spend time with you. So I'd haul him over to see Stanley. And they'd go in there, and he had tubes and a bag and all kinds of stuff by this time. And he'd say, oh, God, you're here. I'm so happy. Another day of life. Another day of sobriety. Guy would be looking at him. And I'd make him hang out there for an hour. And then we'd go outside. I'd say, now, what's your problem? And it's amazing how his problem would have dissipated. It wouldn't look so big. See, we're not in control here. It's a guy who had a baby one time, and he loved Beethoven. And he thought, I'm going to make my child love Beethoven. And he hated Bach. And he said, I'm going to make my child hate Bach. So every time the kid was being breastfed by the mother, and things were gentle in the home, he would put on soft Beethoven music. And every time the kid had a crappy diaper or a pin was stuck in him and there was chaos in the home, he'd play Bach. Dun, 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 you know. The kid grew up to hate milk. You know? So there's absolutely no control here. You know? No matter what you think you have, you don't have it. You know? It's just the way it is. The book is real specific in certain areas. The Lahans are getting nervous. <laughs> the book is real specific in certain areas. It says probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. And it says that God could and would if he was sought. And it gets to be real gentle here. As time goes on, you become more and more, at least this is my experience, you become more and more grateful for each moment of each day. No matter what's going on, it's okay. Because you're sober and you're being in a position to help other people. My mom used to tell a story. I don't know where she heard it. But it was a good spiritual story and as kids we used to just lap it up. And she used to say that there was a boy who went to parochial school and next to the parochial school was a church. And every day this kid would run in and he'd kneel down in the back of the church and he'd say, Hello God, this is Johnny. I just want to tell you, I'm here. And then he'd boogie out of the church. And he'd do that at noon before he went to lunch. And he'd do it after school before he went out or, go, or went home with the other kids. And he did it day in, day out. Weekend in, weekend out. Summers, winters, holidays. That was his spiritual program. Hello God, this is Johnny. I just want to tell you, I'm here. And my mom said, that as the story went, when this kid was about 13 or 14, he, he developed a terminal disease. And he was dying and he was racked with pain in bed. And his parents and his school chums and his friends and his neighbors were all around the bed. And she said, a little light shone in the room. And a voice was heard to say, hello, Johnny, this is God. I just want to tell you, I'm here. And you see, that's the deal, being there. When I was drinking... There were a lot of people who loved me, and I couldn't be there for them, just the way it was. But now that I'm sober, I get a chance to do all the things that I never thought I could do. The book is absolutely right. We will be rocketed into the fourth dimension, and we'll understand a way of life of which we had never dreamed. We can't dream about it. How can you dream about something you don't know? And so the deal is, is that today, I live the best life possible. I get a chance to do everything I ever wanted to do. And I didn't even know I wanted to do it. I have two kids who I'm very grateful for. I went through a divorce and ended a marriage of 22 years in 1981. And my kids stayed with me at that time because they just felt it was a better situation for them. And I had a chance to develop a real special relationship with two kids who at one time in their life, by court order, I couldn't see. And they're both doing real good. 
They don't have any, thank God, so far any affliction with this disease. One is married and living in Seattle, and I had a chance to visit him last week when I spoke up there. And my other son is a would-be actor, and he's hanging out in Hollywood. <laughs> and they're verbs. They're really verbs. <laughs> you know? And we share a relationship that's real special. You know, one of the things that will happen to you after you're here a while is you'll begin to understand the AA vocabulary and the lingo, and that's good because you know all the buzzwords. But the communication that takes place here is from heart to heart. As you stay here longer, you'll find out your mind is really just in the way because all the things that count come from the heart. God, spiritual, serenity, bliss, they are, they're all God, they're all heart emanated. And what will happen is you'll be able to develop relationships with everyone. And it doesn't make any difference where they are as far as geography is concerned. You're there with them. And they're special, special to you and you're special to them. And it gets real, real easy. And you get a chance to pass on stuff here. And you don't have to know anything. All you have to know is to be there. And we have a language all our own. People call on the phone and they talk about the weather and what politics, whatever it is, and we know they're hurting. And we talk from heart to heart and we never mention the problem, but the solution is arrived at. Thanks for being there. I'm glad you were there so we could talk about the weather in Oklahoma. We developed that. We're like little kids. If you want to really learn life, watch little kids. They haven't developed all those hang-ups yet. You know, if they go on the beach and you watch them, they run up to a girl and they want to kiss her and she pushes them away, he doesn't call a sponsor, you know? <laughs> he does an inventory. He just goes and finds another little girl, you know? <laughs> Kids understand that stuff. It's like when your, your child is maybe four or five and they draw in the, in the kindergarten a picture of a duck and you, they bring it home. And you're really ecstatic about it. And you hang it on the refrigerator. And the kid is so proud because they got a star for that duck. And every adult who comes into your kitchen will look at the refrigerator and say, What's that? And the child will proudly say, That's a duck. See, we're in two different worlds. But you get another five-year-old to go in that kitchen. He says, Hey, nice duck. <laughs> See, that's the way it is. And all I can say is my message is hopefully real simple. Be real good to yourself. Cut yourself some slack. God has you here for a purpose. You don't have to become anything. You already are. And what we find out here is we get a chance to find out who we really are. We never knew who we really were. We grew up in a world where if you made a mistake, you were a loser. We've grown up in a world where we're told more what we can't do than what we can do. People are constantly putting fear into us about looking bad. You know what happens when you try and fail. Everyone laughs. Hey, let them chuckle. Can you imagine the story in here about Wilbur and Orville Wright? <laughs> Coming home to their mama, we can fly. Stay off of that shit, it's starting to affect your brain, you know? <laughs> Don't let anyone tell you what you can't do. Be courteous. If you're asked for advice, listen. Someone may be able to share some experience with you. But make sure when you make your decision, it's based on your heart, where you're at. Don't let anyone else direct your life. God went through a lot of work to make you an individual. The more we find out about the human anatomy, the more individualized we become. DNA fingerprints, regular fingerprints. He knew what he was doing. There was never any two of us manufactured the same. And he wants us to come down here and, as the book said, be happy, joyous, and free. We are not a glum lot. Guy in Brooklyn thought that was all one word, glum lot. <laughs> you know, and you may be, as they say, you may be the only copy of the big book that someone ever sees. And if you want to learn a good prayer, the best prayer I know is how you live your life. 
That's the best prayer you can give to God, how you live your life. If you come into a room and people are glad to see you and you're always up and you're always positive and you're always contributing and it's always good stuff, I always tell the guys that I sponsor, go for it. They don't even call me most of the time. They said, I went for it. You know? <laughs> go for it. You can't fail. But if you come into a room and everyone says, oh, here comes the hemorrhoid, you know? <laughs> That's not the way it's supposed to be. We are supposed to be happy, joyous, and free. We're God's kid. He gave us everything. He gave us the whole world to play with. He never had Lincoln Logs. That's why he had to have alcoholics. <laughs> he gets up in the morning and says, I wonder what they're doing today. You know? <laughs> Get used up. Don't put anything aside. Whatever you have, use it up. Get totally used up as quickly as possible. Get empty, totally empty. Whatever you have, share it. Give it away, get rid of it. Don't have anything that owns you. Get rid of everything that interferes with that connection with God. This whole life is nothing but a bridge to God. That's the whole reason for being here. Don't suck out and build a house in the middle of the bridge. You know, move on. It gets real easy and someday, Someday, you'll get to the other side, whatever that means, and he'll be there, and you'll be brutalized by life. You'll have scar tissue all over you. You'll be beaten up. You'll be totally used up. And he'll say, you did good. Come on in. Don't worry about how you look. Be concerned with how you feel. We're counting on you to screw up something. That's why you were sent here. Don't be afraid. Get into the game. Be a verb. If someone says, let's talk about love, say, no, I'm too busy loving. And when you get up in the morning, no, don't worry about the committee. You know the chairman of the board. You know? Get up. Get going. And you'll find out it's real simple. It's real simple. There's nothing to figure out. I don't like to say this because the Lahans are traveling with me. But if I was to leave here today and not make it home for whatever reason, nobody owes me anything. I had the best life and the best run, and I owe it all to you guys. It's just that simple. And there used to be a song way back when, and it says, if someday someone should write my life story, for whatever reason that might be, you'll be there between each page of pain and glory because you're the best thing that ever happened to me. God bless you.